qualify for this race. A couple of days ago, his car was on the East Coast. Force's crew drove straight through to Spokane without sleep, making six runs yesterday. The most runs ever made by Force in one day. We ran Philadelphia Wednesday night, and we won down there, and it just took 60 hours to get here. And, and uh, when we're done racing here Sunday, we're going to go right back 60 hours back and run English Town. But your question was, how did I do it in the beginning? If I told you the truth, you wouldn't believe it. You'd think I made it all up. Do you really want to hear the truth? Do your viewers want to hear the truth? Yeah. The truth is, in 1974, I raced cars. People don't know I drove a front engine dragster. People don't know that I drove a fuel alder and rolled it end over end on a back street trying to impress my wife, Lori. Almost killed myself back then, and nobody knew who John Force was. And always chasing corporate America. But corporate America wasn't some big company. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, McDonald's or AT&T. Corporate America was a little stereo store on the corner. It was a, a, a opening Wendy's hamburger. It was a not corporate General Motors or Ford Motor Company. It was Don Steve Chevrolet. You understand how it evolved. But my very first true sponsorship, I'd read a sign and, and, and I'd come back from Australia in 74, 75, same year Jaws come out and, 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 and The Exorcist. And, and boy, when you see the movie The Exorcist, and my motors needed an exorcism, trust me, to get the demon out of there. They blew up, set me on fire, but that's why I got famous. And the, the people love me. This guy can't win a race, but he's on fire. Every week can't beat Don Perdome, he's a joke. But man, he'll tell you a story. He'll do all your shows, he'll stand on a street corner. <clears throat> and he'll tell a story and the fans love him. But 30 years later, I'm, do, I'm still standing on the street corner, still preaching the gospel of the fans, and still blowing up them motors, except winning championships now. I came back from Australia. <clears throat> I had a ramp truck that I had before I went over, but I wanted to buy a, a crew cab pickup truck because I wanted to get a Chaparral trailer and I was negotiating with Joe Paisano to buy his old Chaparral because all the big guys, Don Perdome, the Blue Max, the Mongoose, they all had crew cabs with CB radios, with, with sleepers on the back. I could put brute force on the side, it would be awesome. And I went into Don Steve Chevrolet and I met this fella, Tom Steves, the son. He said, look, we hire people that stand in the parking lot and they're a tree. I even did the tree once. I did the Wendy Squirrel. I've done it all. But he said, what can you do to make some noise? Could you start that car? I said, yeah, I'll do a burnout. Understand this 1976. I'll do a burnout in the parking lot. He said, okay. He took my Corvette and trade, gave me a deal on a truck. I painted Don Steves on the rear fender, Chevrolet, and, and he paid for the sleeper was $175. Now I got everything and I went down and my brother Louie off his 18 wheeler gave me used CB antennas. Put on the antennas, I looked like everybody. Right, it was awesome. Went to Don Steve's that day, fired up the motor, packed the parking lot, did a burnout, couldn't get the car to stop. Luckily there was a driveway, I whipped it out on the Whittier Boulevard and everybody thought unbelievable and Tommy Steves came to me and said I'm gonna give you hundred and fifty dollars a month hundred and fifty dollars you know what the rent was on my apartment hundred and twenty five now I had my rent paid okay now I can say I can pay my rent I can at least live because my race car was out in the street, had to move every Tuesday, had to move the trailer so the street sweeper could go by. That's how it was. Now, here I am now, and now <clears throat> I'm running around town, 
and the most embarrassing thing was one of the race teams had come into town and I think it was Raymond Beadle was late getting in the racetrack in Orange County and this guy ran over to my truck and said we want to call McEwen out there because he's let or Raymond Beadle can we use your CB to call him and he opened the door he goes where's the CB I didn't have a CB but I had the antennas I looked like the big guys so you had to give that look for corporate America okay <clears throat> later on I'll tell you the story about Leo Stereo how I got the CB so here I am now I got 150 bucks a week I got Don Steves on the side of my my crew cab and I go to, 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 to Wally Thor's school of trucking I went in there because I figured I'm a truck driver this guy would want to sponsor me hi I'm Wally Thor for a truck master school of trucking in Whittier California we have more job orders than we have graduates to fill these positions we coordinate job orders with the placement directors for truck masters five other branches He's opened up these places around California to teach young men and women how to drive 18-wheelers. And I knew how. Talk about a crossroad, about a break. I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, got 150 from Don Steve's, pays my rent. Now i got to get some money, and I can buy a, a, a two-speed transmission. I only had high gear. So many things I can do. This was exciting times. <clears throat> I wouldn't leave. Sat there half a day, Saturday morning. Well, that day, one of his guys that ran the, the school that trained the drivers was gone and he was all frustrated and I wouldn't leave and he finally came out personally, a big guy, looked like Wally Parks, walked out there and said, son, I don't have time for you, I lost my guy, unless you know how to talk to these kids, because, yeah, I do, and I entertained them, made them laugh, told them about truck driving, how their life was going to be great, told them I was a famous race car driver and they never heard of me, but they heard of Don the Snake Perdome, and, and uh, in the midst of all this, this guy says, you're pretty good, he said, I'm going to give you, I think it was like $500 a month, or whatever the number was, $900. $900 to do what? And I was with him for about, but I would come every three Saturdays, and then I'd have to go off and race, because back then I only match raced. And, you know, I could, I'd run Orange County once a month, maybe Irwindale on a Saturday night, but after I'd do his show, I'd go to the racetrack. Now I got another gig. Now John Ford's race and his start. <laughs> so there was no just marketing. It was me. And that's, you see how it evolved? I'm running around town. I see this sign, Leo Stereo. Because Wally Thor lasted about eight months and that was the end of that. <clears throat> Leo Stereo, I went here to get a CB. And I actually met uh, the owner of the, of the store group. And uh, he came out and he goes, well, what do you do? And he told me the money that he spent paying for clowns and stuff. I said, I can bring my race car, put it in the parking lot. We can start it. And he'd buy me a drum of nitro. And that's how I got my start with him. Because he had to buy me the nitro so I could start the car. But what was left in that drum, I took to the racetrack. <clears throat> and, the, and I did this, I did this without any written proposal, nothing. Just talked my way into it. And then one day I'm on my way back from Bakersfield. Leo Stereo did its time. Got no sponsor, got to find a sponsor. And, and I look up and I see this sign, Wendy's Hamburgers. Ketchup, tomatoes, onions. Mustard, ketchup, and mayonnaise. Cheese, lettuce, and onions. Onions, mustard, and pickles. Tomatoes, relish, and cheese. At Wendy's, you get lots and lots of your favorite toppings. Open 25 stores in Southern California. And I remember thinking, a square hamburger? I'm a hamburger freak. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. A square hamburger. My wife said, might be dumb. Glory, always there. Uh, I don't even think we were married then. We weren't even married then. She was going to San Diego State getting her degree. So I called up the Wendy's Hamburgers franchise down in Lake Forest. And this guy answers a phone named Dan Scalia. And he goes, what's your name? I said, John Forrest. He didn't care about me. He started talking to me and told me he was a, an announcer for motocross, off-road motorcycles and stuff. And you think I could get him a job? Here he was, sir, head of marketing. Just got the job but he really wanted to be an announcer. So 
send out a proposal, I sent it down, he sent it right back. The spelling's terrible, this is terrible. So I had Lori rewrite it all for me. We sent it back and I got my first Wendy's deal. It wasn't to race, they didn't even care if I raced. It was to get him out to meet Bill Donor. Donor gave him a part-time job on the weekend. He did some announcing and um, there I was, sitting in front of Wendy's stores. That's how it all started. From Fullerton, California comes the Corvette of John Force. This is the final race in the second round of Funny Car Eliminations. Alongside of Force and in the left-hand lane or the good lane is Joe Pisano's car driven by Tom Ridings. Ridings has advanced up from the pro comp ranks, those are the alcohol burning funny cars. Now in the nitro burner of Joe Pisano and smoking the tires, going all over the racetrack is Ridings. He's still in it, but from behind comes John Force, just sticking with it at 7.23 seconds, hardly any time to talk about, but it's all important as to who gets to the finish line first. The times really mean very little except for lane choice, but it's who's at the finish line first. That's what counts. The losing time for Tom Ridings was a 7.27. As we watch, we see Ridings going up in smoke just a few hundred feet off the starting line. The car drifting sideways. He gets it back straight. It goes sideways again. He drives it straight again. He gets back in it on the power, but here comes Force. And look at the Corvette move by just at the very few final feet. John Force, that's one uh, you might have uh, thought you lost had you not stopped stuck with it. Steven made one of those all-time screw-ups. I left the starting line in high gear. I can't believe I did it. My car was weird acting. I went out there and uh, just did everything wrong, pedaled it, hit it, but I seen he was in trouble. I recovered it, reached down and shifted it in high gear, and I was in high gear. I got to apologize to my guys because they worked hard, and I I screwed it up, and, and the Lord just let us pull that one right out of the bag. You've got a reprieve as you go to the semifinals. Uh, you'll never do that again, probably. Oh, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes before this thing's over, but that's a, that's a killer, to be that dumb. It's dumb. It's, it's, it's the pressure. When I got in the glue box, the car was sideways coming out, and I had to pedal it. So I thought, well, I'll leave it in high gear and try to do another dry with it to save from wearing the clutch. And when I backed up, my whole program changed, and I never thought to put it back in low. And it was just one of those dumb Seems to me it takes a heck of a guy to admit it. <laughs> I'm a heck of a guy. Okay. You left after one of the sponsors, and you're buying some American sponsors. We were actually in the middle of Louisiana. And the floorboards in my truck, Lori was in the truck, in the crew cab, and all of a sudden I'm smelling this smell of leather or rubber burning, and Lori goes, oh my God, we're on fire. And her feet had melted to the floorboard through the carpet. That's how hot the mufflers got, pulling an overloaded trailer. Back then I carried national dragsters, I carried grease sweep, anybody that would pay me all the stuff to the race ship with John Force, and that's how I get the fuel uh, and, and her feet and we got out and it, the muffler had blown a hole in the muffler imagine going down the interstate listening to that kind of noise Lori's over there with earphones on trying to keep the noise out to, to get to Baton Rouge but that was the year at Baton Rouge I lost to Kenny Bernstein in the final round and you know how many champions I lost to? Raymond Beadle, I lost to him in the final. Uh, there were so many guys. John Lombardo I lost to. All the, all the champs. Went. But we pull over, and I was driving my own truck. I was doing clutch in the car. You know, I had a couple of guys with me. <clears throat> and I'd seen this sign, and it said, B of A. And that wasn't in Louisiana. That was back earlier. And my guys said, you know, we don't have any spoilers, and they said the track's really loose. So what we did was we borrowed a sign. It was hanging on a chain. We borrowed this sign. That's the truth. Well, I had to cut up the sign because I had to wrap part of it around the muffler. And then we, you know, we tied it in there, you know, with, with steel ties and uh, stopped that muffler noise. It was still blah, 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 blah. But it was terrible. But that's how we did it and you could cook an egg on the floor. So, <clears throat> we got, and it was a loose racetrack, hotter than heck in, in Baton Rouge, and so I took those spoilers, but I gotta be honest, I had learned, you put a sign on a car, people will come. I painted Coca-Cola real big on my car, 
I never got a penny from them. And that's how I got stop and go markets. Well, if he's with Coca-Cola, that's one of our big, you know, suppliers, and we'll go to them and we'll get money in return. And I said, oh yeah, I'm with Coke. And they went on and, and, and they met with Coke and Coke ended up giving me money. Our name's already on your car. We don't get it. That's how it, it was. It's a wheeler dealer bargain, trader deal, barter deal. That's how I did it. And I showed up at Baton Rouge and the announcer, John Force, looks like he signed a deal with Bank of America. You know what I'm saying? And that is how it kind of evolved. But we put them up and it said B of A. And the announcer, everybody thought I had a deal. I never did, I never did get a deal. But I could tell you, my banker, when I'd call her up and I'd say, it rained out down here. I can't cover that check I wrote on Friday. She'd have to hide it in her shoe for a couple days. And don't think that stuff don't happen. There was a lot of good people along the way helped me get here. And that's why I never forget. Every time I get stupid and start thinking I'm, I'm a big shot and I'm Superman, I think about how I got here and the people that helped me. So it's just by pure luck of fate. So now Pepsi comes to me. Well, you're with Wendy's. That's when I got with Mountain Dew. And I got Mountain Dew now. I got Wendy's. You see how it starts? And it's happening to kids out here every day. Haddock's doing the same thing I did. That's why I love the guy. You know what I mean? Izzo. These guys are all doing the same road. And they're survivors. They'll make it. And then in that process, talk about faith again. I'm not on the circuit. I don't run NHRA. Didn't even know what it was. And then I get a call. We got a problem. Don Perdome's with Pepsi. I was with Mountain Dew and a little Wendy's. But he got the Wendy's and the Pepsi Challenger. He went national. Well, Perdome said, I can't do displays on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. We're at the racetrack. Well, one of the franchise owners of Wendy's down in Florida said, I want him here Thursday and Friday, or don't bring him. Perdome rolled into town, did his display on Thursday, and said, I can't be here Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm in a race. Well, Phil Dunn didn't want to hear it. All he cared about was selling hamburgers. So they sent me all the way from California. And there I was, Friday morning, when everybody's at the racetrack, Johnny Loper, trips you make, you know, people in the golden days of racing. I'm, at, I'm out there in front of Wendy's, right? All my guys are happy because we all getting hamburgers and hell our happy days when they come out with a salad bar. So, hell, they have breakfast now. We've been in heaven. But there we were, and for Dome's guys, of course, we packed up later in the afternoon, didn't make the first session, made the second session, fall right into the staging lanes. But we warmed the car up at the, at the, at the Wendy's, set the clutch in it, and then when our show was over, we hauled butt to make the second session of qualifying. And we didn't qualify. But they said, hey, you want to go to the next deal and do those displays? And Don Perdome was my hero. And people wonder why I love him. <clears throat> you know, because he was who he was and had to race. It was still a little place for John Force. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that was the involvement. And then Phil Dunn uh, took me on to, uh, with Wendy's National, and I went over to Coca-Cola. And then I was with Coke Wendy's, Perdome was with, you know, Wendy's, you know, Pepsi, and it all kind of evolved. Then I went to Wiener Schnitzel, stop and go. It was all about working the streets. And that's where I came from. But now I've got to have agencies because it ain't about a thousand dollars a month. It's about a hundred thousand dollars a race or three hundred a race. You understand? It's all changed. In his rookie year on the Pro Tour, he's been drag racing on the West Coast for a number of years, but the first time with a really quality operation is John Forrest. And I'll tell you what, when he gets the helmet off, it'll probably be full of adrenaline. These guys have worked hard. John Forrest, did you think it was possible? The final round of national events. Can I say, the Lord's with me here. I'm digging this. <laughs> he, uh, I guess, breaks it and falls with Raymond there, and they fell with me, and... And I'm going to put Wendy's right in the winner's circle on this next one because she ran good and she shook just a shade, but she was making it. She's ready to run. Okay, you didn't get lane choice, so Bernstein ran a little quicker. Is that a factor, do you think? Uh, it could be a factor, but uh, 
I think when the Lord's rolling with you, it's rolling. I'm going in that final round. On a hot roll, John Ford. Okay, first of all, I want to clarify. I know you know what you're doing here, Bobby, but Elon Warner filming, does he got this thing right? I think so. Okay. Well, he couldn't do any worse than I did, that's for sure. <laughs> I just gave you history. Now they started a motor, shut it off. There was a lot of good people along the way helped me get here, and that's why I never forget. Every time I get stupid and start thinking I'm, I'm a big shot and I'm Superman, I think about how I got here and the people that helped me. So, so when you screwed up this interview, with your new film crew guy that forgot to plug in the deal. That was me. Elon. I know. That yeah. was me. I screwed so up. So I was right. able to take the story because I got a lot of the places put together wrong. I'll edit it. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It'll, good. Right. John Forrest, no matter uh, how big the margin, uh, you never seem to know if you won or not. I never know. Yeah, tired. Uh, it left good, but it shook hard. I seen him. It's kind of funny, I walked through that door tonight and I looked out there and I said, I can't even believe this deal. I see all these superstars, I, I see Perdome, I see Beetle, I see McEwen and Lombardo, Paisano, and I said, oh man, this, this must be heaven. And Donor walks through the door and I said, oh shit, blew this deal. Your first year on the Pro Tour and your second final round appearance, you've got to be uh, really happy with yourself. Uh, I love it, I love it out here. It's kind of a simple deal for me because all I do is, uh, is kind of uh, keep the sponsors happy and, and do what they need to make it work and uh, the rest I, I got to hand it all to Steve Pluger because uh, he's got to make this whole thing work. Well he's going to have to find a tenth of a second to race the Blue Max. Well leave it to Pluger he'll figure it out. John Forrest going into that final round.